This week, I'm joined by Matt Alderman. Our first segment is an interview with Mayhol Ravenkar. He's a senior product manager at SaltStack. He was with us at Black Hat. He will be discussing the SecOps challenge, specifically uh, more information on patching, which is something that Matt and I, of course, and, and Mayhol love to talk about as we were all attainable uh, in a past life. In the enterprise security news, Signal Sciences rolls new application security product out for release. A10 brings zero-day automated protection to DDoS defense. That sounds really, really sexy. Uh, and some acquisition and funding updates from the likes of Symantec, McAfee, Cyber Reason, and Capsulate. In our final segment, we're going to air three pre-recorded interviews with NetScout, Remediant, and Bitdefender from Black Hat USA 2019. Stay tuned for all that and more on this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. Prevention-based tools leave you blind to threats inside your network. By adding network traffic analysis to your SOC, you can find and stop attackers before they make their move. ExtraHop provides complete visibility at enterprise scale. Detect threats 95% faster with machine learning that helps tier one analysts perform like seasoned threat hunters. Visit extrahop.com forward slash security weekly to learn why the Sands Institute calls ExtraHop fast and amazingly thorough. That's extrahop.com forward slash security weekly. Networks are becoming increasingly complex and fragmented, and digital transformation and DevOps are driving an explosion in network connectivity changes. With each new network connection, cyber attackers may gain another opening to breach or traverse the network. At Tufin, they've pioneered a policy-based approach to network security management using automation and analytics. As a result, you can make network changes in minutes instead of days reliably and securely. To learn more about Tufin, the security policy company, go to securityweekly.com forward slash Tufin in and sign up for a free evaluation. By the end of 2020, 99% of exploited vulnerabilities will be publicly disclosed and known to IT system admins. The consequences of that fact means the burglar will already be in your house because you left the front door wide open by failing to patch known vulnerabilities. How can you keep the threat actors out? Through cloud-based automation, Automox enables you to slam the door on unpatched OS and third-party vulnerabilities across your entire Windows, Mac, and Linux infrastructure. Take advantage of a free trial with Automox to not only see the vulnerability status of your infrastructure, but do something about it within minutes. Start automating the fundamentals of cyber hygiene at securityweekly.com forward slash Automox. That's securityweekly.com forward slash Automox. Welcome to episode 149 of Enterprise Security Weekly for August 14th, 2019. We're back here in the studio doing the show. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, joined by Matt Alderman, who's on the lines remotely from Colorado. Matt, welcome. Better than Vegas right now, I think. <laughs> yeah, Vegas, I mean, it was hot, but we were in a suite this year, so it, it was nice and air-conditioned and stuff. Yeah, we just didn't get as much exercise as we normally do because we weren't it's walking true. all it's over true. the place. It's true. I actually went for a walk one night. Uh, we get out of the Davidoff Cigar Lounge, and I was like, you know what? I, let's just walk the strip for a little while because I really haven't done much walking, and I could use some exercise. So... It was good. It actually wasn't that hot in Vegas this year, as years passed. Or we just didn't realize it. Or, yes, or we just didn't realize it. Well, it's good to be back in studio. A couple of quick announcements uh, before we get started. Uh, we have exciting news about the Security Weekly webcast program. We're partnered with ISC Squared as an official CPE provider. If you attend any of our webcasts, you will be receiving one CPE credit that's if you're signing up for new webcasts at securityweekly.com forward slash webcast or watching some of our on-demand archive content on securityweekly.com forward slash on-demand. Our next webcast will be with Zane Lackey of Signal Sciences, where we're going to be talking about application security in a very pragmatic way, um, looking at how you deploy security inside of your app and monitor uh, the application for security and performance once it's in production. That's going to be uh, a really fun one as always. Um, is there another announcement here? There is. Um, many of the big East Coast cybersecurity trade shows take place in crowded cities like Boston and New York. Where parking is a nightmare and it will cost you an arm and a leg. However, 
This year's Compass Cybersecurity Symposium is being held at Twin River Casino in Lincoln, Rhode Island, just 15 minutes outside Providence. The venue has plenty of free and easy parking. Speakers include social engineering expert Chris Hadnagy and Security Weekly podcast founder Paul. Oh, wait, that's me. Yes, I'll be speaking there as well. You can use the discount code SW2019 and save $20 on registration. Mayhol is joining us again. He's the senior product manager at so I always just call you Mayhol. Like I never I don't think said your last name when we worked together at Tenable. It was always just Mayhol and everyone knew who I was talking about. So Mayhol's here with us. Uh he's now at Salt Stack doing all kinds of cool things. Mayhol, welcome. Hey, thank you, Paul. Thank you for having me on the show. One of the things that we talked about uh, well, I actually, we talked a little bit about before the show, this show, um, but we talked about patching and the new capabilities you're building and your team's building inside of the product at SaltStack to help people with the patching problem. But I want to go back to um, something we were talking about that, you know, we've phrased this many different ways. Like people try to do the basics, right? There's all this advanced stuff out there. And you, if you walk the show floor, I didn't. Uh, you saw all the advanced things that people are doing, machine learning and uh, all these, you know, fancy things. But in my experience too, is that most enterprises struggle with basics and fundamentals and making sure those are done right, such as patching would be one of those basics and, and fundamentals. Um, so it, given that approach, what are your thoughts on like where people are with patching today, given all of our backgrounds uh, working for Tenable? Where do we stand today, Mayhol, in terms of patching? And what was the, the, some of the problems you were trying to solve with your new uh, implementation? You know, patching is a very interesting problem. When I was working at Turnable, we would get like the plugins out within less than 24 hours. And we were always rushing to the, get these plugins out uh, within hours, right? Something like Heartbleed or WannaCry came out. We were all stressing about how fast we can get them out. And then I come out in the field and I talk to our customers. You know, the patch cycle to some, for some of the customers is six months. Yeah. Sometimes it's a year. Uh, weekly is like the best I've seen, mm -hmm. uh, or at least bi-weekly. So, you know, we talk a lot about detecting vulnerabilities, uh, even configuration issues and compliance violations. But when it comes to actual changes, that's, that's a really slow process. And, you know, and there is a reason for it because changes goes through the ops team. And, you know, they have a responsibility to make sure their systems are always up. They never go down. Um, and, you know, like compliance or security is least of their concerns, right? So, and, you know, when they have to make changes, they have to plan weeks and months in advance, right? And on the security side, we're always looking, rushing, let's, you know, let's get this patch out, let's get, you know, heartbeat patch and so on and so forth. And usually something like heartbeat happens, the, the planning usually takes a back seat. So there is a genuine disconnect between like patching the, the art of actually fixing these things and just telling you all these things are bad, go fix it. Right? So it's an interesting problem. We have been looking at it uh, at SaltStack for kind of quite a bit of time. Um, SaltStack has been in the system management space for a long time and the fixing aspect of this life cycle of vulnerability management comes naturally to us. Uh, you know, we've been, uh, you know, automating systems deployment packages, installing packages, and so on and so forth for a long time. So it was an interesting use case for us to pursue. <clears throat> and uh, at Black Hat, we announced that I will offer a uh, vulnerability remediation module. Yeah it's, yeah, it's interesting. I, You know, I feel like I have it easy in the application sense, right? Because I've got a relatively small application and building out a DevOps uh, lifecycle or tool chain for it. And patching just happens naturally. Like when you have a, an application that you're deploying, right? And it, mileage varies, right? But the tools are available such that every time I build locally as a developer, I can go pull all the latest packages and yeah. it's just part of my build process, right? Like it builds it, tests it. If it passes, then it just pushes wow. it through the next test, right? There's a couple of tests that can happen before I push it out. So patching is just, it's like built right into the DNA if you wanna do it that way uh, for your application. Um, that's why when I saw like Equifax was an example for me where I was like, well, if I had an application and I was using my model for building applications that is pseudo DevOps right now, right? The goal is mm -hmm. to get full DevOps. But if I was using that, I'd just constantly be building with the new version of struts. And when it breaks, it won't go to production. Developer will get a ticket go address that issue, 
push out some some new code that maybe handles the the way the patch changes functionality and push that through if it passes then push it through to production right now and that's the application side the it and infrastructure side i we're still struggling there right and i think that's what you were alluding to certainly yeah, so the, the, what you're saying is definitely the modern approach on how things are moving in the future, but there is still uh, a lot of legacy or IT systems that are on-prem or in the data center. They still have to go through a very rigid uh, change control process. Right? Yeah. You cannot just fix these. You cannot just patch these systems. You have to create a ticket. You know, The ticket has to go to the manager or the system owner. That person has to review it. He has to get approval from all the stakeholders. You know, maybe there are some applications that sit on those systems mm-hmm. which cannot go down, and so on. So there is a lot of um, there is a lot of push and pull between these teams to get just get the work done. And I was talking to one of the CISOs at uh, at Black Hat. He said, "My job is essentially a glorified project manager." Mm-hmm. Uh, because yeah. all I'm doing is just pushing these tickets, getting work done, you know, you know, with all the, you know, but all the cajoling and bribing that happens to get people to work done. Because if you think about it, you know, patching is not just the only res- responsibility of the ops team. I mean, they're also deploying systems. They're, you know, uh, you know, upgrading their systems and so on and so forth, un- unrelated to patching, right? So this is just one additional piece of work that they need to do. So you have to slide that in- into their workflow somehow yeah. and get their approval to it. And so unless it is really critical, like unless it is they're re- hearing about it in the news, they're like, why should I patch it now? We have all these other high priority items that I need to do. Um, and, you know, can this wait? And, you know, the wait is just the natural way to just delay things and right. not fix anything. But when you when you read the Phoenix project, for example, it, it's really hard to get that full DevOps into your infrastructure, right? But one thing that they talked about that I think everyone can take a page out of that book literally, right, is unplanned work and how much unplanned work in the grand scheme of things, right? You mentioned the CISO is a project manager now. In the grand scheme of things, unplanned work costs you more than really any other type of activity, right? And by doing that diligent maintenance in smaller chunks, right, Mm -hmm. and making sure that you avoid that unplanned work as much as possible, you're in just better shape altogether you'll have more time for projects right and the longer you put off those patches the more debt you incur the more a bad a bad time you're going to have right when it finally comes time to push that patch and you've got too many dependencies matt i I see you're you're chomping at the bit so (laughs) this is why the number one use case we always saw when we were at tenable was a simple closed loop vulnerability detection to patching process that's what customers really wanted at the end of the day yes they didn't they, they were like, look, you're going to go out and scan. You're going to identify vulnerabilities. You know what patches need to be applied. Give me the ability to apply those patches efficiently, retest, and kind of close that loop. But yet, nobody was really doing that. It, mm. So, we, yeah, we see it in the application side. But people want that for their IT infrastructure side as well, yep. just so it streamlines that whole end-to-end process and makes it easier. Yeah, and the, the feedback we heard, at least I heard, was we're just creating more work. Yeah, I mean, so we just, you know, if we if we told them you have hundred thousand vulnerabilities, that's just hundred thousand things they need to fix, and mm-hmm. they just don't have the bandwidth or the resources. So you know, you see the emergence of a lot of uh, TVM vendors who do not scan systems, but all they do is they take the data from a lot of VM vendors and prioritize it. So of these 100,000, uh, these are the 10 you can fix, which are the most critical, maybe because they're exposed to the internet or there is an exploit available for this particular vulnerability. So you know that makes it more manageable so you can create 10 service now tickets pretty quickly instead of 100,000. And, um, you know, and... Uh, for us, at least on the South Tech side, you know, uh, fixing things is pretty straightforward because we have our own uh, open source engine which can do this at scale for a wide variety of um, uh, systems. Uh, so it was natural for us to actually chase this use case and uh, get it done. The the other use case here, Mayhul, that I think people have to understand is vulnerability detection is the first step. Uh, and once you get that process down, then we got to go after the configuration side. And and we continue to this day. I mean, there were two last week of misconfigurations creating breaches in the environment. Mm-hmm. It wasn't mm-hmm. a vulnerability. It was literally a misconfigured setting in a cloud yep. environment that created the breach. And so 
because we're so overwhelmed with vulnerability detection and the basic patching, we're not doing the things we need to do on the configuration side to make sure our environments are locked down appropriately, and both are creating lots of entries for breaches. And I was talking to Paul about this at their Black Hat interview. You know, S3 misconfigurations is such a common thing now. I mean, most of the data breaches that are happening are happening because of S3 misconfiguration. You know, you can, um, you know, poke around, find these misconfigured S3 buckets, and there's all sorts of sensitive data in there. And no one had to run a scan. No one had to do any sort of uh, high, you know, high profile things that most attackers we assume do. And right there, they had all the access they need. Yeah, one interesting thing about vulnerability management and patching is um, being able to roll up that work, right? And I'm curious if you've got an approach to this at, at SaltStack Mayhole, and that is, you know, let's say I identify multiple vulnerabilities, uh, there's multiple CVEs, but it kind of comes down to if I apply this one roll-up patch or, you know, service update to my systems, Basically, of that 100,000, right, it wipes out 30,000 vulnerabilities across all of my systems, right? Not yep. individual, yep. but like instances of those vulnerabilities. There might be 30,000 of them. By sending out this one roll up and rolling it out, I can wipe those out. Do, do we have that like capability? Have you thought about that kind of roll up thing um, that we saw? I mean, when we worked, uh, you know, specifically in the space. So Microsoft has done a decent job, I think two or three years ago, they changed the way they published their uh, patches. They went to a monthly roll-up and a cumulative roll-up. So, you know, to try to move away from KVs for individual vulnerabilities to a uh, monthly roll-up schedule where, you know, it has all the things in there um, uh, uh, to, to pass that might be that might be reported. So that addresses the thing that you just mentioned. On the, on the Linux side, one, the one, one way we tackle these changes is, you know, we have a lot of modules, sort modules, uh, where you could tell, um, you know, like when you see an advisory, it comes out and says version 1.0 is vulnerable and, you know, uh, 1.1 is not vulnerable, right? Uh, if you don't patch it for, say, six months, by the time it comes out, there is 1.6 already available. So the way we do here at Salt is we directly update to the latest version of the application that is available. And so we in, essentially we roll up all the security patches that were reported for a given application over a length of time. So you skip the whole process. You're not mm. going from 1.0 to 1.1 to 1.2. We just go to 1.6. Uh, in, uh, with, with our uh, vulnerability remediation module. Yeah, and, and that's a smart way to do it because then you just you just lengthen the process if you're doing... I mean, sometimes you have to get to 1.6, you have to do the 1.2 to 1.4 to get to 1.6, right? But the goal is to get to the latest stable release of that software and don't worry about any of the vulnerabilities that were in there. You can basically ignore them once you're on the latest version and only worry about moving forward. And that's really common for network devices. You know, network devices cannot just go from uh, yeah. 1.0 to 1.6. We have to, uh, you know, the, like, for example, if there is a firmware update, you have to go from 1.0 to 1.1, uh, restart the system, let it come up, and then apply the next firmware, restart it, and so on and so forth. And uh, on the South tech side, you know, we have a really robust automation and orchestration platform. Um, and... Uh, you know, with that, we can actually orchestrate this whole thing so that you could go from 1.1, 1.0 to 1.6 and doing all the restarting and applying the firmwares um, uh, with our with our solution. Uh, so, you know, uh, that's something we can do as well. So that's interesting because a lot of the SOA platforms, right, the security orchestration automation has been dealing with the incident response side of the house. What yep. you just described is a playbook for the prevent the preventive side of the house or, or that early detection side where I can identify a vulnerability or misconfiguration, orchestrate a playbook that now yeah. allows me to, to kind of sync through a series of steps to update the system, which is kind of nice. Yeah. So, you know, that's our orchestration module, which has been there for a long time. And we, you know, we use the orchestration module to facilitate very complex workflows, you know, you know, installing packages and deploy it to AWS and then, you know, verify it's working. Uh, so, and so on, which is, you know, it's really easy to say on the podcast, but mm. if you have to really code something like this and verify that you deployed the system, verify it is running and, you know, everything looks good. That's actually, um, you know, difficult to do, but you know, with Salt, our users use it to actually do it all the time. 
Yeah, I mean, effectively, you're minimizing your risk, right? I mean, that's what I've learned mm -hmm. about deploying systems and our software over the years is if you think you're going to catch, even in a full DevOps, 100% of the changes and issues, I mean, you're just not, right? I mean, that's why you need that feedback loop and that automation because chances are you're going to miss something. And we do it all the time every time we push out a release, right? Someone finds something that just the process missed, right? I, I, all of our stuff is very complex today. Um, but having that process is important. I think it puts you ahead of the people that don't have that process because if you're just shooting, you know, shooting in the dark, uh, that's much, much worse. Yeah, you know, and most organizations have some sort of uh, a DevOps pipeline where the systems don't just go to production. They go from test to, you know, dev and so on. And SaltStack can actually automate that process as well. So it can deploy to test, verify it's working, and then upgrade it to the dev and, you know, keep on going until it goes to uh, production. That's awesome. Mayhu, yeah, it, we've seen the combination of dev and ops coming together in this DevOps uh, architecture. Uh, yeah. How are we seeing, I mean, from your perspective and the customers you're talking to, how well integrated is, is security into that process? And what of ops is remaining to the side of the DevOps environment? Because what I think it does, it creates a little complexity potentially on mm -hmm. Uh, how how the different teams are working together, right? Is it DevOps? Mm -hmm. Is it Ops? Is it SEC, et cetera? I'm just curious how you're seeing that play out right now. So, um, you know, some of the modern tools that I've seen, uh, you know, the most important criteria for any, you know, tool vendor uh, would be to have an API first approach, right? Um, there is, uh, if you look at some of the challenges or some of the tools that exist out there, they are still... Um, you know, not an API for solution. It's almost like APIs have been slapped over on top of them, and they don't seem like a natural. They don't really seem like a natural um, uh, a fit. So that's uh, that's actually complicated, and it reinforces the siloed based uh, processes that we have. You know, security will do the assessment, ops will do the remediation, and the security will create a scan or do something lob over. Um, you know, an Excel sheet or PDF file. Um, so that's definitely a challenge. Some of the modern tools that I've seen, uh, SaltStack definitely is an API first solution. Uh, so that gives us that advantage. The second thing I've seen is, you know, uh, strict role-based access control. Right. Uh, if you, if you, if there was a solution which uh, was which was going to bridge this gap between sec and ops, you have to con you have to have the ability to configure the system so that you know a certain se uh, section of the of the of the team, for example, the security team can only do assessments. They cannot make any changes on the systems because the ops teams would be super mad if you just if they just realized that their systems were updated without asking them. So um, API first approach, role based access control, having those in place. Uh, if you know if any solution has that, not only just SaltStack, you know SaltStack has it obviously, but if there is any solution which does that, and that I think that is the main challenge. And if they can solve it, that will help bridge the second ops gap. Yeah, and I think your interface actually does a pretty good job of balancing between second ops when it comes to work and the things that need to be done. And I think that's right. helpful because it creates that collaboration between the two teams. They're working out of the same interface. Exactly. And, you know, and we also realize we also realize that, you know, not a lot of customers might use the UI. Uh, uh, so, you know, yeah, customers can use you use this project either uh, through the UI or the API. And the way we did this is uh, in the UI, we consolidated the common tasks into uh, a group of permissions. So for example, a security person only needs the ability to run assessments, right? Uh, or maybe file exemptions or exceptions, right? That's all they need to do. So uh, we have specific permissions in the product where uh, you cannot run uh, the, the remediation module uh, for, to go ahead and actually fix these things or update systems or make changes. And the same thing on the ops side, we configured it so that, I mean, again, again, the administrator can configure it any way they want, uh, but, um, uh, but the ops team cannot run an assess assessment, but they still get to see the same target group or the group of assets the security team saw that you're seeing. So it's the same, so there is no more Excel sheets getting passed over or Slack channel updates, hey, go fix the CVE uh, with SaltStack SecOps. Got it. Mayhal, uh, how have you seen folks using the platform to help prioritize, right? Because we kind of stated, right, we can vulnerability scan, we can look for missing patches, we can look at all these missing configurations. How do you go to your ops team and say, 
we got all this stuff. How do we know what to fix first, right? I mean, it's a combination of so many different things of the factors for risk, likelihood of compromise, compensating controls. I think also the uh, like easeability, like how easy or difficult is it to fix this has to play in as well. Uh, how can folks yeah. use the platform to help with the priorities? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So we, when we look at risk, we look at three aspects. One is the asset risk, like how risky is this asset? Is this asset you know, accessible over the internet? If it is, then you know, definitely prioritize it higher than everything else. Uh, similar, uh, similar view on the vulnerability side of things. If there is an active exploit available, then prioritize it higher. Um, and then we, uh, you know, in the group that at the target group level or an asset level, where um, you know, based on the asset, this isn't DMZ asset with the exploit available. You know, this is you know, these mm -hmm. are definitely more important. But one of the unique things we did with SolStack SecOps is we can differ differentiate between. Uh, genuinely vulnerable systems and not. So let me explain what that means. So, you know, a lot of vendors, what they do is they bombard you with, uh, with uh, vulnerabilities. Like, for example, you could have Apache installed with a, a critical vulnerability on it, but it's not running, right? Do I, do I need to patch it given all the other vulnerabilities that exist out there? Probably not. I mean, I pr probably, you know, because no one can exploit it at this point. So what we can do with SolStack SecOps is we can differentiate between uh, vulnerability that is installed, uh, vulnerability in an application that is installed and running versus install, uh, uh, vulnerability in an app application that is just installed. So the upside for you is you can prioritize the vulnerabilities that are actually running, uh, prioritize the remediation of the vulnerabilities in applications which are actually running in your, in your environment. And if you have applications which are just installed with critical vulnerabilities, maybe you just get rid of them. Mm. Right? You don't even have to, uh, um, uh, you know, you know, remediate them. Just remove the application from the system if it's not even getting used. Why even keep it there? Because at some point, some might, someone might turn it on, and then you might have mm -hmm. a live vulnerability right there. So that's how we started with the prioritization of it because we wanted our users to know of all these. Uh, 100,000 vulnerabilities out there, um, we can actually differentiate between what is running and what is just installed. Mm, that's important. because that uh, yeah, Especially yeah. with containers and DevOps these days, there's a lot of binaries embedded that have vulnerabilities that may never run. Just strip right. those suckers out of there and get rid of them. Exactly. And that's exactly the feedback we got from our customers is, mm. you know, we get these reports. I don't even, if, if this thing is not even exploitable, it's behind a firewall. No one is ever going to get to them. Why even I have, why do I have to pack this in the first place? Right? So we provide that level of insight when they look at the report um, in SolStack SecOps. Uh, it took a long time for us to nail, but, you know, we're pretty, we feel good about uh, having this feature in their first release of the product. Yeah, so where uh, if folks are interested in this uh, feature specifically, uh, where are you with, uh, you know, kind of rolling out to your users? I understand you've got some people already testing it. Is that, is that true? Yeah, so we have some of the major Fortune uh, 100 uh, organizations testing out uh, the product. It's in beta right now. We just announced the beta uh, at Black Hat. Uh, last week, so we are accepting applications for beta. Our goal is to release this in uh, in Q3, uh, calendar Q3, um, and then start preparing for RSA next year. Awesome. Fantastic. Mayhol, thank you so much. Uh, our audience can visit securityweekly.com forward slash salt stack, uh, learn more and see all of the content that uh, we've done with salt stack. And uh, if you're interested, maybe register for the, for the beta. I don't know how many people you're accepting. You get a flood of... <laughs> of people but uh you know we will accept you know you know from uh, anyone who wants to try it out just awesome. you know submit the application and we'll accept it sweet mayhol thank you oh. so much thank you for having me bye with that we'll take a short break come back talk about the enterprise security news stay tuned